<clears throat> What's up, everybody? I'm going to do a quick live stream here. Well, not quick. Usually my live streams take like hours. Um, <clears throat> I've been watching a lot of uh, uh, YouTube videos on um, different like financial news channels like Kramer or any, anything stock market related. I never really watched um, much news on, on stocks. I don't know. It sounds odd, but I, I found it a little boring. Um, listening to just, it's usually the same thing every single day. Well, the past few weeks, I think half the, the people talking were just talking about NVIDIA, how it's, this is the craziest um, growth in a, in a stock and uh, will it come down? What's the future of the semiconductor industry? Um, <clears throat> let me know. Do you guys watch? Um, let me see. I'll pull up my YouTube. Um, yeah, I guess it's just like, um, yeah, Yahoo Finance, NVIDIA, GTC. Yeah, yeah that's the big thing. The uh, NVIDIA conference. That's huge, actually. Um, what, what day is the conference? It's um <clears throat> it's March eighteenth, so it's Monday. Monday nineteenth is Tuesday, twentieth is Wednesday. So Monday through Thursday is the conference. So they're expecting kind of big things. Um other AI companies gonna be at the conference. <clears throat> so I can't say watching these um kind of people talk about stocks has helped me understand and value companies better. But one thing I've learned the past few weeks, because I've been mainly in my car, like if I'm driving, I'll just put on YouTube and listen to like, uh, like they have a lot, like Tom Lee, I've seen him a bunch of times. He's pretty, pretty bright guy. And they just have, here's CNBC. Um, they talk about the rates a lot. Uh, when will the Fed cut rates? And um what impact will that have? Um, so pretty much, <clears throat> I'd say 90, like 8% of the uh, investment community think, think rates will be cut. Um, so very small percentage of people think rates will, will rise um, because the um, government has been trying to fight inflation and it seems like the target inflation rate is 2%. So we're way off that. Um, <clears throat> it's probably close to five, right? Currently. <clears throat> the current inflation is 3.2%. So we're not that far off, actually. They're waiting for rate cuts so assets can rise. <clears throat> right, right. The, the interesting thing is um, when you invest, uh, a lot of a lot of the um, the expectation of the future is already priced into the stock. So you can't really wait for a company to, hey, Dex, what's up? <clears throat> like if you like a stock, you can't say, I'm going to wait for them to become profitable and then I'm going to invest in the company. Because if you wait, like if you waited for Amazon to become profitable or you waited for Tesla to become profitable, you're way past the point of making money. You have to invest well before things happen uh, because the it's always the assumption something will happen in the future. So, <clears throat> so the price of the stock either is driven way up or possibly way down based on the expectation of the future. So you can't just, which is, which is hard. It's not like, um, it, it's not like if your friend said, uh, you know, can you can you invest, you know, 50k in my business? Um, and then you ask your friend, well, are you profitable? Uh, and he says no. And then you say, well, I want to wait till you prove you can make money because I don't want to really give you fifty thousand dollars and then you just burn my money. <clears throat> That's a normal 
logical thing, right? Um, which makes total sense. Um, <clears throat> it's just it's just like if you wanted to buy a small business, you'd rather buy one that was profitable, not one that's losing money. Because if they're losing money, then you'll probably lose money too, right? <clears throat> unless you, you somehow understand the business better than the owner or you're better at running a business better than the current owner. <clears throat> but stocks is a little different. You have to kind of predict the future. Uh, but the one thing I've learned that um, the past few weeks that I really didn't like ever like, not that I didn't know these things, but the, I've, there's so many buzzwords that I've been hearing that – I haven't. I don't really use buzzwords too much, but uh, maybe I'll start using them because um, it, it makes you sound smarter. Uh, like if um, if there's a lot of like um, <clears throat> if if a stock has a lot of momentum uh, pushing it up, so momentum pushing it higher. Or, or, or say there's a stock has momentum pushing it lower. They'll never say that. They'll never say, oh, there's momentum. They'll say uh, that there's a lot of, um, if it's pushing it higher, uh, then they'll use the word like tail, tailwinds. There's a lot of tail, this stock has, has tailwinds, meaning like it's gonna, there's a lot of help getting it moving higher. So it's, like like the tail of a plane, that's what it's supposed to mean. Uh, when there's tailwinds, like there's a lot of wind in the back of the plane, it makes it go faster. And then uh, if there's a lot of momentum pushing the stock lower, then they'll they'll say headwinds. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords. It, it does make them sound smarter uh, because these buzzwords, some people don't even know what they mean. So when you use the words that other people don't mean, that other people don't know what you mean, then you are perceived as smarter. Like, wow, he has such a big vocabulary. Uh, they'll go, yeah, the uh, the economic headwinds on uh, Adobe stock have been pushing the price lower. Because um, headwinds is like the, the front of the plane. So if there's, there's a lot of energy, a lot of wind push, pushing the front of the plane, it makes it go slower. So that, that's kind of like the uh, so he headwinds, tailwinds, and then they'll they'll say, um, well, well, I do I say this too, but like um, I started saying this more like okay, um, you know, Ford is trading at five times um, earnings. Uh, so instead of saying um, that just means, I mean, and some people don't know what it means. I remember for a long time, I never knew what that meant. What is that? Why do they say it's trading at seven times revenue or it's trading at three times free cash flow? Um, that just means for its market cap. I know, I know this is not the market cap, I'm just, I don't, just, but to put it in easier words, um, 500 million and earnings is 100 million. So it's trading at five times earnings. So their market cap is five times their earnings, um, which is price. It's like price to sales. So that's. So it's the price to sales ratio. When they say uh, this stock is trading at three times for, well, not, well, sorry, that's PE. I did earnings. I'm sorry. Uh, that's the PE ratio. When if they say uh, they're trading at five times earnings, that means their PE is five. If they're trading at 10 times earnings, uh, one, one billion. Mark cap, 100 million revenue. So they're trading at 10 times earnings. 
um, well, they also they might say that trading at 15 times revenue, that's the price sales ratio. You're smart enough, the jargon is it's only confusing. Paul, that's why I don't really use jargon too much because, yeah, it does. What happened? Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, because I think it's, 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 it is confusing. And for a lot of people, they don't know um, what certain things are. So if you – Bulldog, everybody subscribe to Bulldog. This is my buddy right here, great guy, another fellow YouTuber. Um, yeah, it, 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 it can get confusing because if you ever um, are trying to follow someone's conversation and you don't understand – like something they're saying, then then you don't hear anything after that. Then it, you're kind of stuck on that term they said, trying to like figure it out, and everything else is just noise. So that's why um, that's why yeah, it's good to kind of simplify things because cause I used to teach math to kids, so I know how that is. Like you can't like everything has to be really super simple. And uh, the more I, t I spoke to the kids, the less they learned. So it was better to do, um, uh, what's that called? Um, I can't remember the term. Uh, but it was, it was better to, to ask questions and have them respond than just to, for me to give them a long speech on how to solve a math problem. It's better just to me to ask them a question and have them answer it or 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 ask them short questions and kind of lead them to the answer. The real Gary Gensler. Um, what's that? What's that? I can't believe I forgot what terminology is to help people to people to the answer. Does anybody know that um, it was a term? I think it was named after somebody famous. You you keep asking leading questions to to until they get the answer. You don't actually tell them anything. You just keep asking them questions, and it leads them in the right path to getting. Um, it'll it'll come to me. Um, okay, types of learning styles. Does anybody want to be a, a co-host? Thank you, Socratic. So it's Socrates. Yeah, I used to I used to use that term all the time, and I forgot it. It's so embarrassing. Uh, yeah, so, so Socratic, the the Socratic method. Another buzzword, you know, I would uh, say, I, I, well, a parent would say, so what's your teaching style? I use a Socratic method. And like, ooh, you sound really bright. Wow, Socratic method. That, that sounds pretty. Uh, um, yeah, the Socratic method, that's, um, is that, is a, yeah, it's a dialogue between you instigated by, yeah, so it's a continual probing question to the teacher in concerted effort to explore the underlying beliefs that shape the students views them. Yeah, so instead of, uh, yeah, well, obviously it depends what level student, but if it was like five times three, which, you know, if you're speaking to a second grader or even some third, fourth graders, they, it's not some, some kids aren't natural mathematicians. so. Instead of saying, oh, five times three is 15, I say, well, what's uh, what's five times three? Uh, well, what's multiplication? Um, can you tell me what multiplication is? And then if they don't understand it, I would say, well, it's, it's just addition in groups. It's just addition, uh, but grouping the numbers together. So you can do five plus five, 
plus five, because five three times, right? Three groups of five. Well, you can do three plus three plus three plus three. Most kids, I think, in this situation, would fives are easy to add up. So I go to, so what's five plus five? Ten. Now what's ten plus five? So just kind of leading them to the answer. Okay. Pro Hazel Khan Bentley Collage. Do you want to house the homeless? Do you want to help fund says build the houses? Um, that's it. So I was doing a video on, I just finished a video on Grab. It's the Uber of Southeast Asia. Uh, they're very similar to Uber. They do ride hailing and they do food delivery. Um, and they um, they have a pretty big uh, presence in uh, Malaysia. Um, you, it's it's kind of hard to think when you're when it's when the camera's in front of you. Like I'm not as relaxed. What's the country next to Malaysia? Um, Singapore, Singapore. Um, like if there wasn't a camera in front of me, I could spit out all this stuff real fast. But I'm uh, I'm not naturally that going. Okay, yeah. So Singapore, I think they're headquartered in Singapore, but Malaysia and Singapore, are, are, I think, are, are connected. So that's where they do a lot of business. But they're also in Cambodia, Philippines. Um, they have 37 million monthly active users. Uh, so in Q4 2023, 37.7 million monthly active users, um, up 12% from last year, up from 34 million. Um, so what's the, uh, let's see if I could remember. So they have a big presence in Malaysia and Singapore. Okay, Malaysia. Okay, make sure I'm not so good with Southeast Asia. I, I know where's okay. Here it is, Malaysia. Yeah, okay. So, so I am right. They are. They do border each other. But Singapore is a tiny, tiny place. Very affluent, very developed, really, really highly educated community uh, is Singapore. So small. So Singapore, Malaysia, I know they're in Cambodia, Philippines. They must be close to Cambodia's right here. They're in the Philippines. Vietnam, too. They're not in Thailand. Wait. Singapore. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 an official country, Singapore. Okay. Don't trust the numbers from the Far East. Right. I, that's another thing. It's hard to trust the numbers of... Uh, like, people think... Um, like, England is a country. Or... or um, do you guys think England is a country um, or Scotland? I mean, they're not countries, right? They're um, it's the UK is a country. Um, if anybody's from that part, I mean, I'm, I think it's like a quasi country, but like the UK is uh, what is that? Let's see if my uh, Northern Ireland. England, Wales, 
Scotland. So that those are our countries. They're, they're just combined there, the UK. Um, not that it has anything to do with investing, but um, maybe it has a little to do with investing. But okay, so Vietnam. Okay, here it is. Singapore, Malaysia, and they're uh, headquartered in Singapore, I believe. Wait. Yeah, they're headquartered in Singapore. Um, yeah, the area served. Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, Indonesia. Okay, Indonesia. Indonesia. Myanmar. Myanmar which is also Burma. Oh, they are Thailand. Okay, I thought they were in Thailand. Okay, Thailand. So, like, if you were to do your due diligence, and you looked at these countries, like, you might look, like, at the population uh, of these countries. And you, you, you know, you also probably want to look at um, the economics. Like, can people afford a, a ride hailing? Singapore must be real small. Cambodia. Vietnam. Because if you, if you want to invest in this company, it'll be good to know, well, that's a big country, the, the uh, opportunity they have, how big these countries are. I, I knew in Indonesia, Indonesia was a really big company, cu country. That's one of the bigger ones in the world, in Thailand. Unfortunately, a lot of countries outside the U.S. they don't have as much money to spend on things. Um, So that's a pretty pretty wide net, 550 million. Wales. It's it's Wales with an H. But don't trust not you it's not Wales. That's the animal. Or or mammal. Uh Did I not write Wales when I when I did that? So what's the opportunity in these countries? You know, it's a pretty big reach, right? Five hundred fifty-four million. That's even that's bigger than the U.S. The U.S. is what four hundred million. But U.S. the reason. The U.S. Uh, 332 million. The reason I'm so stupid. You're right. Wait. Th thank you for correcting me. I hate when I make mistakes like that. So Wales. It's the country spelled W-A-L-S. Yeah. I feel stupid when I make these kind of mistakes, but that, that's how you learn, right? Uh, I guess I'm so used to seeing WH. Um, 
So it seems like um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a little risky. Um, I'm not sure if I. I'm not. A, I'm not a huge fan of uh, of the Uber model. Um, they do have a fintech business. They do. Um, let's see. Um, they have a financial services where they loan out money to to people or businesses. Um, kind of like. Um, What's a couple of, of, of popular fintechs um, that you guys invest in? I'm invested in one. Does anybody know that Brazilian fintech company? Let's see if they put it on here. SoFi is the big one, right? Uh, that, that gets a lot of... A lot of viewers like SoFi. I, I have new and you, but I don't see here. So this is probably just U.S. mainly. And I wouldn't call these fintechs like Visa. They do a fintech division, but they're mainly uh, a regular non-fintech. Um, yeah, I'm in New Bank. Uh, SoFi is big. Yeah, but they also have a fintech arm. Uh, they acquired a, an Indonesian fintech company in 2017. Um, I can't remember the name of the company they acquired in 2017. And then in 2018, they acquired another fintech company. Uh, a Kudo, not that it matters, but uh, they acquired Kudo, which is an online payment company. So that connects perfectly with what they do because they do ride hailing and they also do like food delivery, like, like Uber, Uber Eats. So for them to own an online payment service because customers pay them uh, using those online payments. So it'd be better for them to own it and, you know, take some of the margin for themselves instead of giving it away to um, another company. So Kudo, which which connects perfectly with their um, business model, they even mentioned here, Kudo was integrated with Grab's payment system and was Grab's initial step into expanding fintech services. In November 2017, Grab launched Grab Pay Payment Service as a digital payment service among third-party merchants. So they probably sell their um, their, um, their payment service app to other companies. Because a lot of companies, like any company really, can use uh, a digital payments uh, so people can buy things using uh, you know, their phone instead of having to like pay with cash or bring in a credit card. Um, if I, 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 I much rather pay with things using PayPal than uh, having to deal with like, you know, bring, carrying cash, carrying credit cards, keeping track of all this stuff. I, I loved it when I, when PayPal came out, it took over all that headache of, and and it's secure, right? I, I mean, theoretically it's, it's a secure app. So it, it stores all your information rather than you having to enter your credit card at every single website you go to. Just, it's, a, it's in one place on PayPal. And then PayPal pays any company you buy something from. Apple Pay or a credit card on my phone. We 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 got to talk about Pfizer. I don't want to forget about that. Um, but it's such a crowded space. So many companies are in this um, because it's it's so easy to do. Um, just because a space is crowded doesn't mean uh, you can't make money. Um, the cream rises to the top. So all these smaller uh, companies that do digital online payments are either going to go out of business or get acquired by the larger companies. It's hard to make money as a small company. Um, 
Okay, so in, in 2018, they acquired the fintech firm ICAS Software, which drives Grab Super Apps, all payment transactions across. I don't know which company they acquired though to, to do the the loans. Yeah, I wanted to put more into Pfizer. It's just so hard when a stock goes down. You should you should buy it, or you should be more likely to buy a stock when it goes down, and you should be less likely to buy a stock when it goes up. But but that's not how we do things. We can't psychologically we can't wrap our head around buying a. A falling stock. When a stock is going to the moon, like Nvidia, we all got to keep jumping on the bandwagon. That's when people buy, especially people who don't know anything about stocks. Like people new to the stock market for the first time, they they buy, they bought Tesla at the peak, they bought Nvidia at the peak. Lots of options trading. Oh, good CVS. That's a good company, CVS. Um, so I want to, I want to short NVIDIA. I want to buy puts on NVIDIA. I wanted to buy it. I'm just scared. I'm going to lose all my money. I mean, I don't have to put a lot. When you, when you buy calls or puts, you can't lose. You can only, you can't, you can't lose any, the max loss is what you put into it. So don't worry when you buy uh, when you sell calls and puts, you got to be a little careful. Um, I mean, the most risky investment is selling uncovered calls because you're selling um, some on the option. Um, to buy the stock from you, and if you don't own the stock. I mean, a stock can't go to infinity. We know that, but a stock could go pretty high. Um, a stock could go from like three hundred dollars a share to three thousand dollars a share. I mean, it could ten x in a six month. I mean, it's pretty unlikely, but it's happened. And if you have options, and that's a twenty seven hundred dollars, and if you have like, you know. 10,000 options, which means you just bought a hundred contracts. You're bankrupt because most of us don't have that much money. Even half that, even a, even a 10th of that we don't have. Um, Nvidia raining. What's up? Uh, but I'm not saying NVIDIA can't go higher. Uh, the, the trend is your friend. That's another buzzword. Just go with it. Just stay stay with it. Um, but you just have to remember, I mean, I, probably, I don't know if I would buy NVIDIA at this level. I'm not saying you can't make money. I'm sure it's going to go higher. Uh, I'm just saying if you, if you bought NVIDIA at like 600, um, you know, it's fine to keep holding. I mean, just just stick with it. Um, but don't uh, it, it's going to come down. I mean, we all knew Tesla gonna, was going to come down. We all knew that was extremely overvalued. Uh, joke of a, it's a good company, Tesla, but the stock price was a joke. Like it was extremely overvalued, and it, and it, there was no fundamentals. The, Nvidia has the fundamentals to to prove it's it's worth it. At this point, Tesla never, their fundamentals never got to that point where it was worth a trillion, even close to a trillion, even half a trillion. It wasn't even, the fundamentals never got to that point. Um, the Tesla, what it peaked at like 1.1 trillion. Um, I mean, it's probably a, it's probably a $200 billion stock, maybe 300 billion. But it's just, it's just a car companies generally don't trade, aren't, don't get that high. Uh, people think car companies are great because everybody uses a car and it's expensive purchase. It's not like, I mean, everybody uses toothpaste, but toothpaste is really cheap, right? It's kind of a commodity. Um, it's hard to make billions of dollars on toothpaste. 
you need a pretty big market share and there's a lot of companies who already have the market share. But when you know with cars, you can, you can, you can be, a, have a billion dollars in sales. They're expensive. Um, but just EVs still are just a small portion of the market and cars companies have small margins. So, um, we all knew it was going to come down. Um, it got up to 400. This is stock split adjusted because it was. To see what they traded on that day. So now it's trading below 200. It's still trading above its um, 20. It's low from 2023. Um, but stock price is kind of irrelevant. It, uh, market cap, you you want to see the market cap. Um, and what is it? Is it still like half a trillion market cap? Or maybe it's lower. Yeah, it's still half a trillion. I still think it's it's a three hundred billion dollar company. Um, auto manufacturers and all the the Tesla bulls. They were saying, you know, Tesla is not an, it's a, it's a, it's not an automobile company. It's a technology company. Uh, they sell technology batteries, but I mean, they're real, you know, most of their business is selling cars. Um, Let's see. See, Toyota. So, I, I, if Toyota is three hundred billion, which is probably uh, an appropriate price for Toyota, Toyota is a great company. Uh, I think they sell more cars than any company. They're very efficient at what they do. Uh, they they have really good cars um, that last. They're a really respect respected brand. Um, so if te there's no reason Tesla should be higher than Toyota because I think Toyota probably sells 20 times more cars than Tesla. Um, like GM, 55 billion, 48 billion. These are really antiquated companies that just don't um, don't run well. They're they're you know they they employ a lot of people, so they they're important to the U.S. economy. But they just they lose they don't they generally lose money over time and so I think if Toyota is three hundred billion Tesla is two is 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 not should not be higher than Toyota. Ferrari is a specialized kind of company, so they are a little different. Um, they do sell cars, but the cars they sell are really really premium cars. And people pay a lot. So that's why Tesla, let's look at the price of sales. Because you can't even look to PE because a lot of these companies are probably losing money. So price sales, Tesla is trading at five times revenue, which which is much lower. They, they used to trade at like 50 times revenue. Uh, Toyota trades at one times revenue, which means their market cap is equivalent to their revenue. Um, I'll put revenue on here. Say Toyota, 317 billion market cap, 308 billion revenue. So they trade equivalent to revenue. Um, Ferrari is going to trade at a premium because it's a specialized product. They have a great brand and uh, they have a backlog of people who want to buy the cars. Um, they're never going to sell millions and millions of cars in a year like Toyota does. Um, it's just never going to happen because it takes a lot longer for, for, for Ferrari to be made and there's less of a population of people that can afford one. But they always have that big demand. Um, yeah, so Tesla... It shouldn't be above Toyota. Um, so I think they, they should swap places. 
Torda should be 500 billion, Tesla 300 billion. And even 300 billion, I think, is rich. I think it's around 200 billion Tesla, but we'll see. Because it is trading at five times revenue. So if you think about it, if Toyota was was uh, had the same multiple as Tesla, Tesla should be a 100 billion mark cap if it traded at one times revenue. Um, but look at these other companies like Stellantis, Honda, GM. They trade at a third of um, mark cap. So their market cap is like one third of their revenue. So if they miss, Tesla's going down to what price? I, but I don't know if it's going to go down because there's so many people who are so bullish. So if it ever gets too low, the stock, there's a lot of people waiting. They're waiting for the stock to hit a certain point and they're going to jump in because they always wanted to own Tesla. A lot of people miss the Tesla run. So... I'm doing it in 20 years from now, it's going to be at the right level. But right now, it's just, you know, it's market movement. I buy an oil refiner instead. But I don't know if it of maybe, yeah, like in the next, within the next five years, I don't think it's going to trade at the right value because there's, Elon Musk is, is such a presence. But yeah, what about Pfizer? I think Pfizer is a great, great investment because they just acquired CGen. CGen is a uh, is is big on the cancer drugs. CGen. And. Um, the problem with Pfizer um, is they they kind of went all in on on COVID drug drugs like the COVID vaccine, um, which which was great in 2020, 2021, and even maybe 2022. Uh, they would because it was such a hot industry, and also I think I think Pfizer thought that even after COVID settles down, the COVID drugs will still be around because it's it's just not going to go away but it kind it, it came down a lot there was so much so much scare for at least two years maybe three but now people are kind of over it they're just accepting that people still get covid but death rates are not nearly as high as we initially thought um it's a really really bad flu covid um, but it's not like a death sentence when you get it, unless you have an underlying condition or you're very old or you have something going on, you're probably going to get through it. Um, so, th so th yeah, they went all in on COVID, um, while other companies like Eli Lilly were, um, focusing on other things the the big one is weight loss um which is a huge market in the u.s everywhere but especially in the u.s weight loss is such a big deal um so they really took advantage of uh, the weight loss drug and their stock has is doing amazing um kills me because my wife has Pfizer. I should have, I should, I should just do pretty much most of the stocks she picks seem to go down in her account. Most of the stocks I pick go up. I should just stop letting her pick stocks because she bought Tesla and lost a lot on Tesla, like 50%. Pfizer was actually up because he bought it like 2020. So it was up, it was up like 40, 50%, but now it's down like 25%. Um, I don't think I would have bought Eli Lilly though. I don't, I would have probably, she did, she bought Apple. She wanted Apple and Apple is the best performing, but actually lately it's been coming down Apple. 
Yeah, inverse my wife's investment. Yeah, Eli Lilly has really got a stranglehold on the um, the weight loss market. They're up 500% in five years. Pfizer's down 30% in five years. And we bought Pfizer five years ago, so she's down 30%. Um, so I guess they make Ozempic, Eli Lilly. Nova Nordisk. So Eli Lilly, I know they're big on the weight loss drugs. What what's what are they? What's what's their biggest drug? Lilly diabetes drugs that commonly used off label. What are top selling Eli Lilly drugs? Trulicity. Um And yeah, Trulicity is a big one. Zaprexa. I hear these drugs, but I'm not even sure what some of them are. What Trulicity? That's probably a can cancer drug, right? Because those are the most popular. Oh, at diabetes, uh, type two diabetes medication. <clears throat> so Trulicity is diabetes. Mount Mount Jaro is that cancer? Um, Mount Jaro is drug glucose dependent insulin poly polypeptide and glucagon like peptide receptor agonist. How, oh, so, that, so that's a weight loss drug? Because someone's saying it's how it is. Patients take it as Manjaro, what, three times more likely to lose 15% of the body fat, body weight in over two and a half months. So that's a, that's the weight loss. Um, most... Isn't it interesting when drugs are made for a certain thing, like to cure disease, but people just take them to lose weight? Uh, weight loss drugs. Or a cancer-fighting drug, but people use it to lose weight? Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just interesting. Um, because drugs have side effects. Um, sometimes a lot, of, a lot of people gain weight from drugs. Or they, or their sexual desires decrease with drugs, but I guess if the side effect is to lose weight, then I guess you just you're, you'll take it. Um, so Ozempic is the is the really popular one. Wagovi is a brand name for who makes Wagovi. Wait, is, is Wagovi the same as Ozempic? The FDA the approved Ozempic for the treatment and prevention of type. So yeah, it was a diabetes drug. A lot of these diabetes drugs are taken as weight loss drugs. Was FDA approved. The main difference between Wagovi, am I saying that right? I, I've never heard that word before, Wagovi. And Ozempic is the amount of... Uh, semaglutide in each injectable dose. So they are different drugs. But Nova Nordisk makes both. Supposedly Ozempic is affecting grocery sales. Chronic diarrhea, right. That, that's, a, that's definitely a side effect to, to uh, these drugs because I've i taken things not for weight loss, but like um, uh, to try to get muscle gain or uh, to try to get more cut uh, when I was younger. And yeah, di diarrhea was, was a problem.
Um, anytime you try to alter your yourself, um, it, it's it's not a uh, natural thing. So um, it, it's you you build a dependency on it, and then uh, sometimes you take these drugs in the beginning, uh, and it's a great feeling. Like say, alcohol is same idea is like in the beginning um you love it and but then your body adapts a little bit to it and then you become dependent on it um i never really enjoyed alcohol that much but i could imagine if i drank a lot like every weekend i could after a while i'm sure it it wouldn't be as pleasurable but i don't know but everybody reacts differently that that's a thing with 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 anything with drugs or with any, with any um like smoking or alcohol like some people react fine but other people it can really mess them up because any anything once you introduce anything into a really wide population there's going to be somebody that might die from it or get really really sick from it because the way their body or their brain chemicals react and no matter how many trials because it's very rigorous um i don't know if you guys know about the um fda approval process like they have phase one two three um it's very rigorous um In case you're curious, but it, this is this is good stuff to know because if you want to invest in these stocks and you want to do your due diligence, these are good things. No, yeah. So, so generally, phase one, two, three, phase four is like the final phase to get FDA approval. Um, then they have pre, you know, pre phase one, pre clinical trials, but it's pretty much each phase is to um, see how the drug interacts with a certain number of people. So phase one focuses on safety. Um, and it's and it's different for every drug and every, but this is kind of like a broad, I think, definition. Uh, about 20 to 80 healthy volunteers to establish drug safety and profile and takes about one year. So one year, that's, that's a good amount of time, right? Plus you have to pay these people to be in your trial. And you have to pay the uh, the doctors or pay or pay uh, whoever is conducting the trials. You have to pay them, and it's expensive. Uh, so they have to the safety, metabolism, and excretion of the drug are also emphasized. So they take probably in, in, in fairly low doses. Uh, they give it to different people. You know, they should have in the trials uh, a variety of people like. They should have like a black person, a white person, a male, a female, an older person, a younger person. I mean, you can't have you can't have like a little baby, but you know, a 25 year old, a 55 year old, an 85 year old. Um, so it should be a wide range of people. You know, try to have as many ethnic backgrounds as possible, because certain drugs affect people. Like certain, like black people may. Uh, are more likely susceptible. Um, I forgot what. Um, what it, what it, there some drugs or or some diseases black people are more likely to get, and then some other diseases are white people are more likely to get. So you have to take that into account. What is that? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, uh, what disease? Paul, thank you. I appreciate it. What disease? Are black people is it heart disease more, more likely to get maybe certain types of cancer I, I can't remember what it is what sound it is uh, so diabetes 60 percent more common in black than white I didn't know about asthma I don't know about anything. I think diabetes I was thinking about uh, are more likely in the black community. Despite lower tobacco exposure, black men are 50% more likely than white to get lung cancer. 
strokes. I think that's what I heard too, strokes. But then you have diseases white people are more likely to get. Um, and I don't know if it's from our um, genetics or it's, it's, it's from the environment. Um, because if you, if you um, like certain communities, I think it's American Indians are, uh, are, or certain cultures are really, really overweight and they have a really uh, unhealthy diet. So I don't know if it's their, um, it's, if it's their genetics or if it's just their culture, but what diseases are white people? Did you see that movie with Lily, Lily, Lily Gladstone um, and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio? She did real. She was really uh, um, did a really good job. Uh, a Killers of the Flower Moon. It's a true story. Uh, I much rather watch a movie based on a true story, even though I know a lot of it is not true, but. Uh, skin cancer. That's what I was thinking of. Skin cancer. Yeah. I, uh, it's about the Osage Indi Indians who uh, discovered oil on their property. And they were, you know, I think that before the oil, uh, they found this oil, they were uh, generally poor. Uh, and then the oil, they were extremely, extremely wealthy, uh, the Osage Indians. But of course, uh, when there's money, there's greed and deception. So a lot of white people, well, a lot of white men married women in the Osage community, um, and they 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 ended up killing a lot of the women or killing their families and taking the money. But but it's interesting because the Indians. And I think this is true. They're much more likely to get diabetes. So a lot of them were dying in their 40s and 50s from diabetes. Um, but of course, um, things are different now. Like if like uh, this was in 19, 100 years ago, if you get diabetes, you're much more likely to die young than now because now drugs are better. You know, we know more. Um, so it's a good movie. What disease is most common in Caucasians? Cystic fibrosis. I think white women being a Karen is is kind of a the, the biggest problem. Being a really annoying Karen. So uh okay, so so it's it's interesting, uh the FDA approval. Um so it if you get past phase one, and it's not like you you just conduct these studies and write a report, you have to get approved by the FDA. They have to approve phase one and say, yes, we approve based on the clinical trials. Uh, we feel the drug is safe uh, at this point, and you can continue doing your research. And, and sometimes a stock price will go up a lot if they if a company just passes phase one or phase two or phase three because they're getting closer to um, marketing the drug and once you are able to get FDA approval um, you can make a boatload of money um, marketing a drug you could it's, it's still not easy but it's much easier when you when you have a drug that's been approved than when you have a drug that hasn't been approved yet um, so phase two, uh, they have a larger population of people to, uh, to, to test the efficacy of the drug. Efficacy. Um, I've seen like uh, YouTubers try to, a lot of YouTubers, well, including me, uh, when they, um, do, uh, videos on stocks, they just kind of read, uh, they just read what the article says verbatim. And I do that too. I try to throw in my own opinion, but 
Like I do that a lot with Simply Wall Street. I'll just um, uh, like when I did the grab video, I'd say, okay, let's see what Simply Wall Street says about the company. Grab engages in the provision of super apps in Cambodia. I just read it. Uh, but I've seen people, they, they, some people who, who did that, that, who do that, but they can't read the words. They, they get to this word and they say the efficiency or the, I forget what other words they say, but it's, it's, it's not efficiency. It's efficacy, the effectiveness of the drug. Um, but anyways, I digress. Okay. So the drug's effectiveness in those with a specific condition of disease. So they might start testing people who have a disease related to that drug um, and seeing if their disease improves or not. This phase runs about two years. So another two years of testing. So it's a lot of outlay of money because it's expensive to, um, you have to pay all these people and you might have to pay for, um, you know, an office to conduct these studies and you have to pay for somebody to make the drugs. Um, FDA has also approved fentanyl. That's true, but every, even, even, the, even drugs that do the most good and save the most lives are going to be used by enough people always to, uh, to do harm. So fentanyl is probably a, a wonderful drug to someone who's like has terminal cancer. Like they finally have some relief from the uh, pain of the, of living. Um, so I don't think uh, any drug should be abolished that's, that helps a lot of people, but this is just how it is, right? People are going to take advantage of things. So groups of similar patients may receive the actual drug compared to a placebo. So yeah, you have to do a placebo. So you might have a hundred patients and you half of them get the drug possibly in varying dosages and maybe half the people get a placebo, just like uh, a sugar pill, like that has nothing in it because sometimes and there's been studies done this. Sometimes people taking a placebo, like something that's not even doing anything to them, so like, like in their mind, they start to think they improve. Like there's somebody who who has uh, somebody with a lot of anxiety, for instance, and is always says, "I'm very uncomfortable uh, going spending time with family," or "I'm very uncomfortable in." Um, in meetings at work and then uh, they go to a doctor and the doctor just, you know, tries to like give them ideas on how to act in these situations. And then maybe just gives, gives them a drug that's nothing's in the drug and they, they do better because psychologically they think, which is, which is interesting. There's a company working on a non-addictive drug, Oxycontin. Yeah. Same thing. A lot of addictive so, so groups may receive the placebo or other active drug to determine if the drug has an effect. Safety and side effects are reviewed. So you always have to review side effects. Um, as you raise the dosage on a drug, the more you give of the drug, theoretically, the more chance of a side effect. Um, and you don't want people to get sick or even die, which, which happens even in these studies. Um, Phase three, if they get to phase three, uh, begin if evidence of effectiveness is shown in phase two. You have to do a lot of reporting and provide the reporting to the FDA of, of how the, how the, you know, on each person and, uh, so somebody has to compile these, these reports. You can't just pay like anybody, uh, you know, 20 bucks an hour to compile these reports. You have to pay someone who understands this stuff who can, and who can write it and explain it in a manner that's going to make sense. And that person may cost 
50, 60 bucks an hour, maybe more. So yeah, it's a very expensive process. So phase three, typically several hundred to 3,000 patients are monitored in clinics and hospitals because you have to make sure before it gets into the, um, into the, you know, the, the large population as, as many people are, um, are monitored and take the drug just to make sure. Cause if, if a few people get sick, I mean, die, you know, even die, which would be terrible, but it's, it's much better for like a handful of people to get sick or die, unfortunately, than like millions of people getting sick and dying. Um, but it's very rare for people to die on these studies. But I have seen it before, um, as they do it in a monitored way, where um, so very rare diseases may have fewer study patients. That's I think obvious reasons, right? Scott, East Coast boy, need to cook dinner for the family. Okay, Paul. Thank you. Talk to you later. So different types and age ranges of patients are evaluated. The manufacturer may look at different doses as well as the exper experimental drug in combination with other treatments. So, so combining the drugs, because even though you shouldn't be combining drugs, uh, you can't control if someone's already taking another drug, possibly something they shouldn't be taking or even drinking or smoking. So you want to see how that combines with... Uh, this phase runs about three years. It's already six years into the before the before making any even a penny on a drug. So that's the thing. Like um, even if uh, even if you um, get a drug that passes all the steps in the FDA approval, uh, it could take a decade and like say a 10, 15 million dollars. You have to make a profit on the drug. To cover the not to cover the costs of of all the trials, you have to cover the cost of all the trials for the drugs that fail too. So that's why drugs are expensive. And then phase four, if it does get to phase four, to gather additional information on the safety efficacy uh, before approval. Post marketing studies may take place in groups of patients who are using the drug in real world setting. These studies may identify additional uses, long-term effectiveness, rare side effects that occur in, few, in, in fewer than one in 5,000 patients are unlikely to be seen in phase one to three. So you might have a side effect. You might have 499 patients that have no problem with the drug and one patient gets severely sick from the drug. Um, these rare side effects are more, more likely to be found when larger groups of patients use the drug after it has been approved and marketed. Um, so yeah, so that's why it's such a rigorous process because it's very important that uh, drugs are... Um, but let me know if there's a ticker. Yeah, that was a good, that was good. That on, uh, it was on Netflix, Martin Shkreli. He found a loophole so he would just acquire companies that sold drugs, right? Say, say he acquired, well, we could say, we could find a, he acquired, I think a cancer drug company. Um, but yeah, so if he acquires a company that's selling drugs to people that need, that need the drugs to live. Uh, and if he's, and, and if, his company, the one he acquired, is the only company selling the drug. Then there's really no alternatives. Uh, that's called that's con considered very elastic. Uh, you you have extreme pricing power. So no matter how much you raise the prices, people will pay because they need the drug to live. And there's really no alternatives. It's 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 almost perfect elasticity. Um, so he just he. You know, people are paying 200 bucks for a dosage, which already was probably pretty high for them. And they were paying, you know, every week they had to pay 200 bucks to get a pill to save their lives. And he increased it from 200 bucks to 2,000 bucks or, or from 200 bucks to 20,000 bucks, you know, and people were just like, 
taking loans, you know, selling their homes just to get the drug because it was the only thing that could keep them alive or keep them somewhat healthy. It's really interesting when you uh, watch these things. So you do learn a lot. Um, but he was a snake. You know, he bought the companies, um, even if they were... Um, yeah, it's a, in 2015, he was widely criticized when Turing obtained the manufacturing license for the anti-parasitic drug Daraprim. And he raised the price from $13.50 per pill to $750 per pill. And even if you have like, like say, uh, say the number of people using it, say it's a, say it's not a huge number, say it's 100,000 people, 1350, 70. So that's, that's how much the old company was charging. Let's just pretend they needed a pill a month. Uh, I don't know what they needed really. So, so every month the company made The old company made $1.35 million a month from this drug. So that means each year from this drug, and it's probably more than 100,000, I'm picking, I'm lowballing it. So they made $16.2 million from selling the drug. You know, it might've cost them, you know, 3 million to manufacture and market it. So they, Let's just pretend uh, expenses. Let's just pretend it was one third of the cost expenses. So profit. I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but this is roughly what he did. Per pill. Okay, so the previous company, then then the uh, the enemy company. So before he acquired the company, uh, let's just pretend 100,000 people every month. Every single month they paid $13.50. So that company in revenue was $1.35 million monthly revenue, annual revenue, 16.2 million. And it cost him, I'm just gonna assume it's a third in expenses because you have to market the drug, you have to manufacture the drug. Those are the main things and there's all that. So they profited 10.8 million. So he, in, he just jacked up the prices. And when you jack up the prices, it depends how much you jack it up to. Um, you're going to lose customers. So if you increase it from thirteen fifty to fourteen dollars, you probably won't lose anybody. But if you increase it from thirteen fifty to twenty dollars, you might lose ten percent. So maybe half the people stop taking a drug because they just couldn't afford it, or maybe there's alternatives. So he he. Uh, he charged seven fifty per pill, which is expensive, especially relative to thirteen fifty. But it's affordable, right? Even if it was once a month, I don't know how often people took it. If it's every day, that you know, not many people can afford seven fifty per day. But if it was once a month, most people in the U.S. can afford that. Uh, 
even if it is a big jump. Um, so his, look at his monthly revenue went from 1.3 million to 37 million. Um, and yearly revenue went from 16 million to 450 million. And I'll assume the same expenses, one third of revenue. So instead of profiting 11 million, he profited 300 million. Um, so it's just, it just, um, you know, really gouging people who, who need to live. You definitely should make a profit if you're making drugs. Um, but it, it's kind of unethical to, 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 to do this to people. Um, and that's what he was doing and it worked too. He made a ton of money. Um, cause if this company was, uh, Say this was their only drug, just to say make it make it easy. And uh, and let's say uh, let's say just for argument's sake, I don't know what the the number is. Say Say the way they valued these companies, I'm just throwing out a multiple, was five times profit, the valuation. Um, value, like if it's a small business, like a mom and pop store, usually it's one times profit, maybe two. Um, let's just say it's five times profit, the value. So, so the company that makes its drugs and pretend it's their only drug, so it doesn't get confusing, uh, they view the company as worth $54 million. And if Squarely came along and said, I'll give you a hundred million for the company, they're like, oh yeah, definitely. And then he, and he jacked up the prices. So he, now he makes $300 million profit. So the company is worth theoretically 1.5 billion if it's five times profit. But what do you say? But R and D cost for these drugs is a billion is, is a billion dollars, and the market is a few hundred people. What are you talking about? A few hundred people. Most drugs aren't for a few hundred people. Most most drugs are used by millions and millions, possibly billions of people. Like drugs, like weight loss drugs, you know, probably a, a billion people in the world probably want to take a weight loss drug. Um, you know, diabetes, you know, hundreds of millions of people will want diabetes drugs. Um, you know, a lot of diseases. If there's a, if there is a disease that's only uh, uh, like, like 10,000 people in the world have, it's probably not going to get much traction. There's probably not going to be many companies that are going to dedicate the time to develop a drug. Um, unless it's Unless it's someone like who is um like a humanita humanitarian like a, a doctor that wants to help others so they somehow get funding from different sources to develop these drugs or do r d for these very very rare diseases but there's like thousands of rare diseases that there's some diseases that only like 100 people in the world have and no one's going to look at those drugs or, or a cure for, for those diseases. Those people are just stuck. Uh, yeah, because sometimes you see it on I don't know if you've seen like those TV shows, like how some people like, like, like 500 people in the world have this disease and there's just no help for those people, unfortunately. Anybody have a, have a, a ticker? 
I could do a DCF for, and we'll, we'll maybe look at their uh, 10K or 10Q, see if we can value the company. AER. I'll be right back in one minute. Okay. Every time I come back, there's more people on the stream than when I left. Maybe I should just never just leave and I'll have a million people on the stream at one point. Okay. AER. If anyone wants to donate for a live stream, you're more than welcome to. Do you know, are there financials in US dollars? Or um, a foreign currency? Okay, I think it's US dollars. These are US dollars. 7.6 billion. Okay, so it looks like US dollars. Okay. AER. Okay, let's do. So let's get the whack. Okay, it's pretty high whack, 12.5%. Okay. Um, 17.4 billion 86. Okay, so, so I'm just putting in the stock price and a market cap so I can calculate the shares outstanding. Now let's look at the future revenue growth. 7.6. Not much growth. Let's just put 7.6, 7.88. That's roughly what it is. Let's look at that prior. So to predict the future, I kind of use um, their prior free cash flow and revenue to project the future stock price. So that's a free cash flow, which it's negative only in one year. So if it's negative every year, it, 
it just makes it a little harder to to value. Now let's put in their revenue. So I'm using their prior revenue free cash flow to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. Let's see if I, um, so it looks like they convert roughly 20%. See this negative throws it off because I'm using an average of the past four years. Let's just use 20%. I think that's appropriate. Because if, if a company has, a, has, a, has an off year, possibly because they invest a lot in CapEx, that's kind of an out, outlier, right? It doesn't look like they do that every year. So it looks like they're around 20% range. It's a really high whack too. So maybe we want to lower the whack a little, but if we even keep the whack, so I'm at 75 bucks. Um, what do you guys think on this stock? Uh, Aircap, it's an Irish. Um, Aircap Investor Relations. Um, it's an Irish aviation leasing company. Is that is that one of those companies that you can like get a a private chartered plane or like a you can it's like an Uber for planes? Is that is that like uh, oh they acquired GCAS. Its assets they have fifteen hundred aircraft. So it's, it's a pretty good number of planes they have uh okay no okay so they work with, with airlines oh they lease airlines okay that's a much better business than being an airline being an airline it's tough tough business um i think i've looked at the stock before it, it sounds familiar Maybe I didn't. Let me just look in. Uh, they have good management. That's important. Good management. So how, how do you determine a company that's good management? I'm trying to get better at that, but I feel like I have a hard time figuring out. It always On paper, it always seems... A company has good management. It seems like the managers have a lot of experience, but I have a hard time kind of Boeing should use Aircap. Hey Mike, what's up? GMGI. Golden Matrix Group. It's a nice name. I don't know if I, I don't think I'll be able to get much from this, but hmm. Well, they have positive free cash flow, so I guess I could try. Um, There is a future. They do have growth for the future, positive free cash flow future. Okay, I'll try my uh, my more simplified model. Okay, three oh seven, one twelve. Okay.
Has anybody ever heard of this company? Probably nobody here, right? Golden Matrix? It's really volatile. Oh, they don't have much. Well, I need the future. Oh, there's no future growth. Yeah, there's probably no analyst looking at it. Um, so 2.6 million. Okay, I'm trying to be um, realistic, I guess, on this. So it looks like they have 2.6 million of free cash flow in the most recent 12 months. Um, so it, if they double that, which would be hard to do, if they go from 2.6, these are rounded, but to 5.2 to 10.4. I got them valued at 279. So it still se it seems overvalued and it and that's unlikely that they're going to grow at that rate. And but if they do, so I have them pretty overvalued, but that's this is more kind of a it's not like it, the investment kind of stock. It's more about a tr to trade, try to make a short-term uh price uh, a short term like profit so it's well it was pretty low right it was well it was only two bucks it's not too volatile it was is this a, this is not a spac is it So it was, I don't know, this might have been, uh, I don't think, it. because when you look at the, oh, come on, when you look at historical stock prices, you see how it's like, look, $125 billion a share back in 2010, and it went down to below $25 billion a share. That's because of all these stock splits. They did a one for 2000, a one for 1500, one for 150, and a one for 150. So obviously it was never $2 billion, $125 billion a share. Um, it's because of reverse stock splits. But this might have been a different company, and they just acquired the old company. That happens. That's the more likely situation is they acquired a company and the Everything that happened in the past was the old company. All right, wait. Golden Metro is one of the world's leading iGaming. Okay, I, 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 I've heard of this. Yeah, I've, I've seen this before. Uh, Golden Matrix provides SaaS solutions it owns uh, online gaming IP and builds turnkey and white label gaming platforms, esports technology. Golden Matrix. Uh, what year did it start? It started in 2008. So maybe this is the same company. Did IPO? Yeah. It went public in 2009. 
So the stock is down like 99.999999% since it started trading. So that, yeah, that's kind of a tough one to look at. Since 2020. So you, you got it. Hmm. Okay, so you got it after this split. So, so you're probably not doing it too bad. You're probably close to flat. It did get up to, I think I, I remember looking at this before. It did get up to 1350. That would have been a good time to sell. ADC. Oh, agree realty. Um, a REIT. Um, 57, 5.7 billion. Agree Realty. Do you agree on Agree Realty? Oh, there's no future free cash flow growth. Okay. Okay, so let's do the regular. Let's take their free cash flow. Their historical revenue. Tonight doubled their revenue since 2020. Let's get the whack. Nine point three. Rates are starting to come down a little bit, so wax are getting lower. Let's the future revenue. Six fourteen, six eighty one, seven ninety two. Okay, I didn't. The formula is wrong. Okay, there it is. 87. It seems a bit rich. No, not a spec. GMJ has small coal following. Some people own 100,000 shares. So I'm at 88 for agree. Do you agree with that, the um, 88? Agree Realty. There's no Wikipedia page. <clears throat> Let's look at their, um, they don't have any investor presentations. I like sometimes the investor presentations because it's a lot more kind of like easier to di digest. Um, and sometimes they give you kind of, well, you got to remember these presentations are made to kind of market the company to make it look really good. Um, so they try to put their best foot forward in a sense. Um, 200 million acquisitions closed on the contract. 
commenced four developments. Let's agree to disagree on agree. Nice, Chris. Um, positive outlook on triple B credit rating by S and P. Triple B, triple B is investment grade. I don't know, you guys. <clears throat> Because I think this is well, I don't think is there a triple C? No, I think there's just a C. I, I can't remember what it um so credit ratings. Um I mean I think this is like the S P rating system, but and you have Moody's. Moody's is it looks like triple A is looks like that, double A it looks like that. And I think uh, they also have like triple A. Then below triple A is A double A plus. Below then below that is double A, then double A minus, then A plus. So yeah, I think there is triple C, double C. But I'm not gonna write every single one. Like there's triple B plus, there's double B minus. Um So usually, like, um, if a um, if a municipality, uh, say, um, like Santa Barbara, California, they want they want to build an addition of the highway. So they need a. Uh, I used to do this uh, mortgage, insure mortgage bonds. Um, say they need four hundred million dollars to build a highway. Um, what they would do is they would go to an investment bank like J.P. Morgan and tell them, you know, we need four hundred million dollars. Uh, can you help us sell bonds into the open market? And then JP Morgan would say, yeah, of course, um, for, for a fee, say 10 million, uh, it'd be a percentage of the 400 million. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll market the bonds and get them sold. And then after fees, expenses, say there's other things going on, other expenses, uh, um, Santa Barbara, once the bonds are sold in the open market, Santa Barbara has $380 million because there's all these miscellaneous things, expenses, you know, pay, you got to pay people. Um, so $20 million of those expenses. Then they'll have the $380 million after the bonds are sold, and then they could start building the highway. Um, and... But so JP Morgan sells the bonds. Uh, usually it's to uh, large entities, like maybe uh, like a pension fund will buy, you know, $20 million of the 400 million. Or maybe there's a, um, you know, um, an investment manager in like, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who likes to get some exposure to 
muni bonds. So they buy, you know, three million. I think they're usually in ten thousand dollar increments. So usually it's not like small people like me and you. But maybe this investment manager puts it into his fund, and he uh, he issues shares of the fund. Um, so maybe you, you could get exposure if you're investing with that particular investment manager. But regardless, Santa Barbara doesn't really care. They just want JP Morgan to get the bonds sold. They want to sell the $400 million of bonds into the open market. And every, every, uh, every you know, town, every state, every country has a rating. Um, what's, you know, the S and P rating of the United States, I think we're double A now, right? We used to be triple A for the longest time. So we're double A plus with, um, S and P where, which is a second best rating. The best is triple A, then double A plus. Then the third is double A, fourth is double A minus. Moody still has house of AAA. So the S&P rating, we'll just use S&P, is AA+, which is a really good rating. Uh, S&P rating of California. So if the state of California wants to issue bonds, They're two levels below the U.S. rating because the U.S. is double A plus. After double A plus, it's double A, and then double A minus. So double A minus is still a good rating, as long as it's above triple B. Uh, what's the S&P rating of? I don't know if I could, they'll have this, but let's see. I mean, they they do have a a rating each each town, but it might not be as easy to find. Uh, what is the SP rating of Los Angeles? Let's just do San Francisco since we can find a rating. San Francisco ratings is double A. LA is. Is A? No, I, no, I think it's okay. Let's just pretend it's SF. San Francisco wants the bond. SF is double A, which is actually better than California. California is, is wor a little worse at double A minus. Uh, but US rating is better than San Francisco rating. Um, so generally the, the bond, the interest rate, uh, for these SF bonds, the interest rate that SF will pay, because the reason these investors bought the bonds is not because, um, they want to help support SF and it's, um, it's community. So they have another highway It's so they can make money. So the only reason they bought it was to get a return. So they got to get an interest. So if SF was rated triple A, they would pay 3% interest on the bond. If they were rated double A, which they are rated, they may pay 3.5%. If they rate single A, they may pay 4%, triple B, 4.5%. Anything up, triple B and above is called investment grade, IG. Anything below triple B is big, below investment grade. So if it was double B, it may be like 5%, single B, it may be 6%, triple C, 7%, double C, 8%. Because the lower, the worse the rating, the higher the interest rate because they're a, a credit risk. So um, 
So when uh, JP Morgan markets the bonds, uh, they tell the investors, these are um, double A rated bonds, which carries an interest rate of 3.5%. You know, if you want it to be real risky, you could buy uh, bonds from like Lincoln, Nebraska. That might be like 5% because Lincoln, Nebraska doesn't have nearly as much money to pay the bonds as SF does. Um, I used to work uh, at Assured Guarantee. So we, we were a bond insurer. I'm really getting off a tangent. I, I don't know if, hope you guys like this. Um, if I get off on these tangents, um, let me know. If somebody wants to be a co-host, you can co-host. So anyways, what we would do, um, we were we were AAA rated, uh, assured. We had a AAA. So SF might not need our services, but let's just pretend um, it was, um, what's another town in uh, Bakersfield? Uh, Bakersfield, California. No, Fresno. Fresno. That seems like a... Say Fresno wanted to issue bo bonds, but Fresno is rating as triple B. And that's a high interest rate because that means they have to pay 4.5%. These could be 30-year bonds. So every year... They have to pay 18 million of interest on these $400 million bonds. Let's just pretend they were 10 year bonds. So year one, they were to pay 18 million to all the bondholders. Year two, 18 million every year. And then maybe in year 10, they would have to pay the 18 million plus the principal back on the bond. Um, so it, it might be hard for Bakersfield, I mean, Fresno to come up with 18 million because the idea is they build a highway, uh, and they charge toll and they, they charge a toll. People who use the highway may pay a toll and then the, the toll revenue would pay the bondholders back or or if, if it was a free highway, they may get tax dollars from the state of California. And those um, the taxes Fresno receives from building the highway goes to pay the bondholders. Um, but anyways, however they pay the money, um, hopefully they do pay the money. They could default. Fresno, California went bankrupt. They defaulted. Uh, I don't think the U.S. ever defaulted on its debt. Um, but um, so what my company would do, uh, Assured Guarantee, is we have a AAA rating. So we would wrap the bond. We would, uh, uh, they would be Fresno bonds insured by Assured Guarantee. So we would put our AAA rating on top of the bonds. So in year one, if it was just Fresno, they would be paying 18 million, but with our triple A wrap, they pay 3%. So Fresno saves six million dollars of interest per year by getting the bonds wrapped. And we charge Fresno three million for insuring them. So they save $3 million in interest. We get paid $3 million. We have to charge a premium because what if Fresno doesn't pay the bonds back? It's possible they default on the bonds, and then we have to pay the entire $400 million. Um, so that's why we – Scott, can you do S Sioux Falls, Dakota, please? What, what do you want me to do? You mean find a bond rating? So you muni bonds are – rarely default. So it's very, very safe investment. It's almost like a zero risk industry, but some towns have defaulted. And when they do default, it's a huge 
amount of money we have to pay. So hopefully of the thousand insurance policies we wrote the past five years, we might have earned five billion of premiums. So if we got two or three defaults, we're okay. Once we get too many defaults, we may go to business, which did happen, not for sure guarantee for other bond insurers because of the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, a lot of bond insurers went out of business. Well, they're, they're, actually they're still in business, but they got hit pretty hard. MBIA, the, the big ones were MBIA and AMBAC. They were the big, two biggest bond insurers by far. Assured acquired the third biggest FSA. Now it's called Assured. But fortunately, Assured and FSA didn't do any insurance on subprime mortgage bonds. But the companies that did, some of them went bankrupt. Um, can you do SUFO? 26-year-old associate, associate's degree in accounting, trading and investing. So enjoy being here when I can make it. Yeah, thanks for so what's the question? Do you just want me to see the bond rating for Sioux Falls? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I don't know if I could find it. It's, it might not be as public as it's. You might need to have an account with these companies like Fitch or S&P. To get to get a rating on a company like that, or have a Bloomberg machine, because I don't know if it's like a publicly traded bond. Sioux Falls. Oh, Sioux Falls. Double B. So that's bad. Double B. That's below investment grade. That doesn't mean they're gonna go bankrupt tomorrow, but it just it's it's a higher risk. Um, like. We, a sure guarantee probably wouldn't insure double B bonds. It's too risky. Uh, it's not worth it for us. We usually insure like double B or maybe single A. But uh, yeah, I was just curious because it's growing fast. Um, but that's what it, that's why people like how could a how could a country go bankrupt or how could a state go bankrupt? It's if they default on their bonds. That's how you go bankrupt. When you go bankrupt, you don't you don't fizzle away and die, right? If I if I go bankrupt tomorrow, I'm not going to die. Um, like if you go bankrupt, you just you just have to now uh, your credit rating is is hurt, right? You when you go apply for a loan or get a go get a home, your FICO's low. Uh, you may have to pay a really high interest rate or not get the loan. Uh, you may lose some of your possessions if they, if, but same thing if a country goes bankrupt, they don't, obviously they're not going to die. You know, you don't get, they, but you do have to, um, you might not be able to, to take on debt to fund like, you know, because uh, like every city needs a lot, a lot of money and taxes don't pay for everything. So you might need to build a, a new school, the elementary school is overcrowded, so you need a new school or a, or a hospital. Um, if it's a private business, they don't, that's different. That's their own thing. But for public entities, they need like police, firemen, and they have to fund this. Um, but that's how the, the we went to a great recession is that these, these the subprime crisis, subprime mortgage bonds. Uh, so many people were buying were buying these subprime mortgage bonds because um, because these muni bonds were only paying three, three and a half percent. Some of them were paying lower, two percent interest. Even though they were kind of risk free in a sense, because they rarely default, subprime mortgage bonds were paying like six to eight percent interest. And they also they were viewed as almost risk free also, the way they were pitched to uh investors. So these large like pension funds, or or let's say um it was a GE retirement fund just bought, you know. 
10 billion of mortgage bonds because they were paying such an attractive interest rate. And then when these mortgage bonds defaulted, the GE retirement fund was really low on cash. So the people who retired at GE in previous years had their pensions cut dramatically. They would they were like, oh, we can't pay you two thousand dollars a month. Or well, maybe let's do five thousand a month, like we initially told you, because we don't have any enough money. So now everybody's getting cut in half. So and then uh it's kind of a trickle down effect. When you're when people get less money uh, than they thought, they start they can't afford as much. They can't travel anymore. They can't go out to restaurants. They may default on their home loan because they can't pay their mortgage anymore. So now the bank is in is in trouble because all these defaults and it just it gets worse and worse. Um, that was a pretty long tangent on uh, mortgage bonds. I'm not even sure where we were. Um, yeah, that's why the, some of these towns, they're so small, they just can't get funding because it's kind of like your your friend who, who never had a, a stable job, who never made much money, just did side jobs doesn't have much in savings. He's never going to have a house, probably. Um, he's never going to be able to get buy his own business because no one's going to give him money. There's just too high of a credit risk. Same thing with a town. If they don't generate much revenue, tax revenue, they don't have many businesses, no one's going to really buy, buy their bonds. And they'll never be able to like grow and attract businesses to their town. Like You need a highway. You need access to it to a town for a lot of businesses to succeed because because if you're a business you need people to get to your business or you need to get supplies to your business if you're a supermarket and there's only a dirt gravel road that leads to your supermarket it's going to be harder for um deliveries um yeah okay so what we say, okay, agree realty, um, that's what it was. Fortress-like balance sheet with over 1 billion of total liqui liquidity. They Yeah, that's what you, you buy a reach for these dividends. A 2.9% year over year. They probably pay like a six, seven, eight percent dividend. 5%, okay, so not that high, but. Um, Agree Realty, um, it's a REIT, a retail REIT. So let's let's look at the retail REITs to see the, the uh, dividends across similar companies. Okay, re retail. Dividend yield. So the biggest company is SPG. Um, uh, Simon Property Group, right? Oh, O pays a monthly dividend. Um, o is uh, what's O? Uh, what's it? What's O? I, I can't believe I can't. I really can't think of oh ticker. It's on the tip of my tongue. Realty income, yeah. Okay. Um. So these are the yields. O is five point nine. If you want a monthly dividend, O pays a monthly dividend. Six point six. So not too high. I can't. Really, you don't. They let you sort it. 
No double digits. I'm surprised. Usually you'd see us some double digits in here. Um, but you get you get usually if you have a re, it's higher taxes. So even if you get a higher dividend, you might not get as much in taxes. Because say you get a six percent dividend. You may get taxed like you know thirty two percent. Okay. So if, if you if you owned a re you may pay uh, um regular taxes um Okay. Taxes. Well, it depends how much money you make. Okay, here. This is long term capital gains. I want to see both combined next to each other. Okay, long-term capital gains tax. How come it's there's no tables? Oh, here it is. That's 2015. That's fine. I mean, I, I just to give you the idea of how this works. It's probably a little different now, but this is a few years old. But so, like your regular paycheck, um. So re ordinary taxes, and then let's say a, a regular stock. I usually always use Microsoft. I don't know why, but a regular stock, like it could be any non re or MLP, and you pay long term capital gains. So. So let's say your income was like 85K. For a, a REIT, you would have 25% taxes. And then for a, a non REIT, it would be 15% taxes. So let's say, I know it's not that high with. So let's say you, you receive 6% from I'll just use a, a regular stock, like a non read. If you receive 6% from a read and 5% from regular stock, and for a read, you pay higher taxes, 25% taxes. So you would receive 4.5% for, for your dividend. It doesn't matter how much you invested. It could be a dollar or a million dollars. Just worry about percentages. And for a regular stock, if they paid a 5% dividend, you get taxed at 15%. So you would actually be better off buying a REIT because you get a little higher. But let's say it was closer. It was 5.5% for a REIT and 5% for regular stock. 
you're better off buying the regular stock because after taxes, you get 4.3% and a REIT 4.1%. But it's different, you know. What, what if you're a college student and you don't make any money? So you have zero long-term capital gains or regular income tax of 10%. So it would be like a wash. If, if the REIT paid 5.5% or the regular stock paid 5%, it wouldn't matter. You'd get the same take home. Okay. So, any other stocks I should do a DCF on? Let's see. Announced the appointment of company live, live, Ling Long He to the company's board of directors. 4.3x pro forma net debt to recurring EBITDA. 70% of base rents acquired in Q4 derived from investment grade retailers. It's hard to like look at this stuff because there's so much stuff. There's so much going on. There's so much information they give you. It's it's almost like you um you get lost in all the info. Here's some of their ac historical acquisitions. In 2013, 2013, they acquired first tractor supply. Oh, here's the rating. They rated triple B by S and P, and B A one is like is like triple B plus. So they're rated a little better by Moody's and S and P, as long as it's triple B. If it's double B or lower, it's it's a much higher risk. Investment foresight. Gerber collision. Um, does anybody know about Gerber collision? I'm not. Oh, it's just a retail business. A deep dive on ADC's thought leadership and track record of execution. So they have a, a, a relationship with Gerber Collision. So they buy the real estate. Like they might buy a 5,000 square foot property. So since for 10 years, they've been working with Gerber Collision. So all that means is and you can do your due diligence by looking up Gerber Collision and seeing what type of company they are. Because you want to you want to make sure they're a healthy company that can pay back pay the lease payments on a property they're leasing from a grade. It's hard to probably tell because of the Boyd Group, they acquired Gerber Collision. So maybe the Boyd Group is public. So maybe you can look at their financials to learn more about. But it's just, it's just a, a glass. Uh, they repair glass on cars, it sounds like. Um, So they, they work with this company on 20 locations. They may have hundreds of locations, Gerber, but on 20 has spearheaded organic growth for now 15th. They're the 15th largest tenant. So th this is what they do. So every time Gerber wa wants to open up a new retail store, say, they, say they're looking at locations, they're like, oh, we really like um, uh, Boise, Idaho. We feel like it's a great place to have a Gerber store they have a fairly affluent a lot of people blah blah so um they they talk to agree 
and they say, you know, we want to get a store in Gerp in uh, Boise. So they find a location. It's $10 million, like this 3,000 square foot property. So Agree buys it for $10 million. And they, you know, they probably get a mortgage on it, like a five, six percent interest rate mortgage. And then they charge Gerber, like, you know, I don't know. They do the math to figure out how much they have to charge Gerber per month to get. Like, say, for instance, uh, an easy way to do it, say Agree gets a $10 million property and they, they mortgage $9 million, they pay $1 million up front. So let's say Agree pays 10 k per month for the property. So they may lease it to Gerber for 12 k or 13 k I don't know. They need to make some profit out of that. And the nice thing is Agree owns a property. So even if Gerber did go bankrupt and they could, and the prop and the, that uh, location, they weren't making money for some reason, even if they didn't go bankrupt, they just weren't making enough money at that location. So they had to close it down. Uh, Agree can still just lease the property to somebody else. So it's a great way for Gerber to, to scale and grow if they have a relationship with Agree Agree buys a property and Gerber leases it. Oh, they have 70 locations with Agree. Uh, and they're developing 20 to grow. I have I had re a retail store. I actually had two. I was thinking of buying the property. I thought that would be a great investment, but it was so much money to buy it. I would have to, it was a shopping center. So I would have to buy it. And I had two locations in a shopping center and I could maybe, I could lease out the other locations. I actually do bookkeeping for a, uh, a, a real estate management company currently. They own um, mostly commercial, uh, some residential, but they own uh, a few shopping centers in the, the county I'm in and a few in San Francisco. Okay, so it looks like they, they give you a lot of info on their uh, tenants. So TJX, is, is that TJ, TJ's, TJ Max, TJ Max. That, they acquired 50 TJ Maxx locations. Those are big stores. So they probably, you know, we have some tenants that pay like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a month in rent, like really big tenants, like supermarkets or big uh, stores like a Target or TJ Maxx. They first worked with TJ Maxx 2012. Walgreens. That's probably one of the bigger ones. They ADC reduced Walgreens exposure from 30%. So they had a lot of exposure to Walgreens, now only 1%. Let me know if is there any other tickers I should do a DCF on before I sign off. There's only six people in the chat. Maintaining our discipline. Yeah, let me know in the comments if there's another company we could do a DCF on. Um, then we could look at their investor presentation like this. So they're comparing uh, Agree to other companies, other uh, retail REITs. Uh, maintain top three sector concentration. So like FCPT, I'm not sure who FCPT is, Four Corners Property Trust. So they're saying Four Corners Pro Property Trust is very concentrated. Like 80% of their tenants are restaurants. Then you have auto service and medical retail. That's 96% of their top three sectors. Agree saying we're diversified. We have maybe 10% in 
grocery, 10% home improvement, and 7% tire and auto. So 27%. It is a garbage processing company. What's a garbage processing company? Gerber is a garbage processing company. So if you wanna like, probably you thought of this before. We all thought of this, thought about like, buying properties and renting them out. Like if you own your home, that's great. You don't have to pay rent anymore. You can just pay your mortgage. Uh, but you you can, you may want to buy your neighbor's house or maybe a, an apartment in your town and then lease that out. It seems like a great idea because you can, uh, you can get your the tenant to pay the mortgage. You charge them and then eventually you own a property. Um, if it was only that easy. Um, some people are really successful with that, but it's, it's. A garbage processing company. That's a good industry, garbage processing. Um, driving results. <clears throat> Investment grade exposure. See, they're, they're saying how much exposure they have to investment grade tenants. Tenants who are triple B and above, <clears throat> that's 69% of their portfolio. Their peers are 31%. So everything always looks great in these presentations. It looks like they're the best company in the world. <clears throat> their net debt to EBITDA is 4.3x. Their peers are worse at 5.3x. That means uh, how many times their EBITDA covers their, well, how many times their net debt covers their EBITDA? INVH. Invitation. Did we look at this last time, Invitation Homes? <clears throat> it's so hard to, because you, you have to time it right to short, right? You can't, if you time it wrong, I mean, you could be totally right. A stock company could go bankrupt, but if you if you're wrong on timing, you you won't make any money. Potentially. But I like the idea. I'm trying to. I'd like to try to time stocks where I can buy options because I want to make a killing on a stock and. Then not have to work ever again. Eight eight six one billion. <clears throat> so I'm at twenty nine and trading at thirty five. So not not too far off. Um, Invitation Homes. It's a decent market cap, twenty-one billion, three percent dividend. Um, on another residential REIT. It's kind of like a, a slow burn for a company like this because it, it takes time for like your tenants to like. If you have some crappy tenants, uh, it could take like years for them to eventually go out of business or stop paying. Roseville. Oh, I, that's in the Bay Area. It's not a great community. 
It's okay. Uh, it's uh, it's north of San Francisco. I mean, it's north east. Um, was it was the largest owner of single family rental homes in the U.S. They own 83,000 rental homes, 16 markets. <clears throat> so why do you think it's a short? Like, do you think uh, they have a bad portfolio? Or do you think the real estate market's going to go bust? Invitation Homes, Investor Relations. So if you want to like try to identify something in their financials that is bad, it's probably not going to be in their um, presentation. Because the presentation tries to highlight the good stuff. The 10K and 10Q... You might be able to find problems. It's just really hard to do that. You really have to be really shrewd on and understand things really well. I have a hard time sometimes figuring it out. Average occupancy of pre-pandemic, 97%, up from 97.5%. <clears throat> We we remain well positioned to deliver outsized AFFO um, adjust, adjusted funds from operations growth through our creative home builder relationships, supply and demand fundamentals for SFR housing. SFR is that single family residential? Single family residence. Okay. Single family residence. Um, <clears throat> I think they don't they don't keep enough cash to cover upkeep. Okay, so they have a lot of exposure. So they're pretty concentrated in a few uh, Atlanta, they have a lot of Atlanta. And they have a lot of homes. They have a lot of uh, inventory. It's a, rates, rates are really, uh, a company like, like this are sensitive to interest rates. Um, what about AI? Like, Sometimes you got to think what company or industry is going to be positively and negatively affected by AI. Because a lot of industries that have um, a lot of like, um, uh, what's it called? Minimum, like uh, minimum wage workers. Um, I mean, at McDonald's, you know, probably AI might not. It may do some, they might have some benefits with AI, but it's probably not the type of place where you can have AI replicate. But if it's a, um, if it's a business that just, um, like, um, what's it called? Like a collections agency where they just make phone calls, maybe AI can, can at least do like the initial, um, round of calls and then once it gets a little deeper when you contact someone or you need to like a, a more back and forth dialogue maybe you have a, a real person but ai um 
mean, I think that's that's the big push. I think that's the big reason they think AI will be as big as they say is because it's going to uh, help a lot of businesses save money. Because I think a, a, like a doctor or engineer will, is less likely to get taken over by AI, but certain industries are healthcare, education. I mean, it's just so many. But it's it's going to be a long road to get to that point. It's going to take a really long time. You have to get people to first buy into it. And then you have to get people to train people on it so they know how to use it. Um, and, of course, then you, you have to – assuming you get people to do that, you have to perfect it so it works. Pharmaceutical companies will benefit from AI by running tests through AI instead of the long phase trials. That's what Moderna did. Oh, there you go. Pharmaceutical companies. Instead of having a person conduct these studies, you can have AI do it and track the results. AI, logistics. AI is going to disrupt most verticals. Logistics is target rich opportunity for AI. There are thousands of knowledge workers in the logistics industry. These are people who know about routes, cargo, workarounds, and so on. We already have autonomous vehicles on the road. In the future, we have AI scheduling AI-powered vehicles. Imagine Chegg, an education stock that kids use to, to pass college classes. Yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, kids are using chat GBT. Remember, when we were younger, we had to write an essay, but now chat GBT can write it, and then we can just kind of like change a few things around to fit the topic. <clears throat> Cybersecurity is a big one too. Yeah, I heard that. The majority of cyber attacks have an AI based angle, meaning cybersecurity has AI ingrained in its DNA. I expect businesses to adopt a proactive, continuous, real time approach to risk management using AI and ML, I guess machine learning, with external threat intelligence. Healthcare. Most industries will soon have to rely on AI to survive, but the impact on, of AI on healthcare is going to be tremendous in two areas. First will be the ability to detect life-threatening diseases such as cancer earlier and more accurately than humans. The second will be the acceleration of drug discovery and clinical trials, which will reduce both the cost of healthcare and the time it takes to release new drugs. AI will replace hedge funds. That would be interesting. They should have AI scout baseball players. <clears throat> you ever see uh, um, uh, Moneyball? Just use a computer to figure out the best baseball players. Yeah, I think it's going to – I do see the benefits. Um, it's just – it's kind of like in the mid to late 90s, like what were the benefits of um, the internet? Like it's cool to have access to like an encyclopedia, but like it was still like people trying to really understand like how do you monetize it? Like – like, like they talked about stuff like this. Like you can, uh, if you, um, if you sell anything, if you sell uh, books or furniture, you can uh, place it. You can sell it on the internet instead of having people come to your store, and then they could ship it. You know, there's all these things, but like, but but doing it was the hard part. Amazon was able to do it really well logistically. They were they they created it, the mold, almost better than anybody else. Um, so but 
it's hard to get a company, you know, to get from the point Amazon did to where they are now, or even not just where they are now, just, just getting to a point where they can like ship and deliver things very efficiently was a very hard task. Amazon took about 20 to 25 years to become profitable, right? I don't know how long they took. Yeah, it sounds right because they had a ton of expenses, CapEx, and but they did it. They figured it out. I mean, on a small scale, like the internet was was good. Like if you had a small business, even if you were just in college and you you can like, um, sell like something on, you create a website and sell it, or you'll just create an, a website and sell ad space, like create a website and that's free to everybody and just put news on the website. Or you can have a specific website for certain t topics, like uh, a website for like sports trivia, a website for um, how to learn math and make it free that would charge ad, ad space. So, you know, it was there, but it, it just, it, the hard part was getting people to like do the grunt work and actually build these things up. You know, some people were able to like take shortcuts. They just bought uh, website names. That's, that's all they did. They just bought like, uh, you know, like Macy's.com, Kmart.com, they just bought it and then they sold it. So you could take shortcuts, um, but the real, the real growth and the real benefits, it took a, it took a while for it to happen. Um, but AI, I don't think it's going to be as straightforward as the internet because AI, it's going to be hard for people to wrap their heads around how to, how it works and actually implement it in their business especially people who aren't, you know, so tech savvy. I mean, if you're super tech savvy, you're probably not working at an advertising firm selling advertising space, or you're not working at a, you're not working at a bank issuing loans. If you're like a, a you know, a, a computer programmer, um, I mean, it can, that's why when you know computers really well, you can start these businesses and disrupt everyone. Craigslist created on version one or two of the web and has never changed. Yeah, no, they. that's interesting. Yeah. But they never really made money either, Craigslist. They always struggle to, to make any money. But I, I think the person who created Craigslist wasn't a, uh, wasn't in it for the money. Uh, he did end up raising a lot of money and getting investors, but mainly to just to keep keep the website afloat. That was more like altruistic than uh, um, like than, than the, most of these people who just want to make millions or billions. Fortune described their revenue model as quasi-socialist, citing their focus on features for users regardless of profitability. Yeah, I don't think he would ever really... They started as a nonprofit that offered free and low-cost events, accepts charitable donations, and, and rather than directly funding organizations... It produces face-to-face -face events. Yeah, but that'd be cool if you built a website where hundreds of millions of people use it and, but yeah, you're right. And it never really changed. It always has this like MS-DOS kind of feel. 
But it's cool. I mean, it works. Any other tickers that, that uh, you guys want to look at before I, I log off? AWS, yeah. That, if it wasn't for AWS, because Amazon just a, is a, it burns a lot of money. It's just a huge money burn. But when you have such a large base of customers, it makes it easier to like venture into other things, make it successful. Because if you have a business, uh, say you have a, a grocery store in your town and 90% of the town goes to your grocery store. So you have like, say 90,000 people over the course, maybe that's too many, but like 10,000 people over the course of a week stop in your store at one point or another. It makes it easier to kind of like advertise things to those people if you wanted to do something else. Did you look so far? thing the guy talked about the other week. I looked it up, but couldn't verify what he said. Oh, the sofa. No, I... From what I understood, um, sofa... It... Yeah, the Sofer is going to take over LIBOR, but uh, Sofer works. Sofer is adjustable, so it's going to take all those fixed rates. Didn't it, wasn't that it? He said, I, I mean, I, I can't. It's, I don't really see the connection to, like, how it's going to ruin things, but I... I, I I mean, it could. It's just hard for me to. It's a lot of steps to happen. It's kind of like Tesla is going to disrupt the car industry. Like, it could. It hasn't yet, but there's so many things that need to happen for that to happen. Like, it's just so many like layers of things. But it was interesting because um, he was saying. Uh, all the the contracts with LIBOR need to be updated, which would cause a huge issue. Um, it's kind of like, it reminds me of like a Y2K where everybody was like, it's like every computer is connected, is uh, calculating the year as a two digit year. And nothing in the world will work once 2000 hits and it's going to take years to get caught up. But it, it was just all hype. Um, I'm not saying that about this, but I'm just saying I, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to like visually understand like, or how it's going to affect things. But it was definitely interesting. But most things are blown up um, when someone uh, talks about something. Uh, it doesn't matter at what scale it is. It's always like the world's ending. Like if there's ever like a war going on or there's ever like a pandemic, it's just like it's so talked about constantly where and then it gets uh, then through other people trying to like uh, explain it. And then they explained it to someone, and it just gets more and more extreme to where it, people think it's the like the world's ending. But it's usually uh, it's usually minor. Even even like a war, uh, you think, oh my god. Uh, remember what what was the um, was that ninety four? Yeah, because it's right after the World Trade Center bomb uh, the, in the Middle East, right? Yes. Was it just. What, what, what was that? The United States? Not, not, the, not Bosnia. Um, 
Maybe it was after 94. Oh, the Gulf War in 91. That's it. Okay. Oh, the Gulf War was before they bombed the World Trade Center. Okay. Remember the Gulf War? And they were like, you know, what if what if they attack us? You know, it's it's always it seems like it, it's always a lot worse. Mueller. Mueller. Did I do it? Mueller. Mueller. Not Mueller. Mueller. Yeah, I did a video on Mueller. Um That was a month ago. <clears throat> okay, they were at six. Oh, I, I, they were 49, and I had them at 60. Okay, they were up a little bit. Um, yeah, I covered a lot, but that doesn't mean we can't look at it. Were you the one who, predict, who asked for Mueller? Yeah, not good revenue growth. It's gone down a lot in, in the past few years. Metal, that's it, metal fabrication. Mueller. Okay, yeah. Piping, industrial metals, and climate machinery. Hundred euro company. Yeah, copper, right? That hit an all time high recently. Wait, so the yeah, copper. Copper is the one that is going up a ton, right? Oh no, maybe not. I thought it was copper. No, no, I can't. Okay, so it's almost three hours. It's a long stream. I guess I'm losing my voice a little bit. So, uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around. Um, and, uh, and commenting, I might do a stream tomorrow. I usually see how I feel if I'm in the mood. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. I'll I'll talk there. Check out my video I just posted. Okay, see ya.